Hey everybody, welcome to Box Jelly for Civil Beats um, elections pop up. I think this might actually be the last one uh, before the primary election. And with us tonight, we have Kim Koko Iwamoto, the uh, candidate here for House District 25. Now, he did extend an invite to House Speaker Scott Psyche. He declined our invitation, um, so I'll just be here talking to uh, Kim Koko. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, and, and just a little housekeeping rule. We, I, I've got a bunch of questions of my own to ask Kim Coco, but if any of you have questions that you want me to ask her, um, write them down on a index card that our staff has. It's at the front table next to the Musubis, if you haven't already gotten one. Um, and w w uh, hand it to someone in a Civil Beach shirt. They'll run it up to me uh, so I can ask it. Don't try to shout the question. We've had people do that, and the reason why I'm asking everything is because we're recording this. Uh, we need to talk into the mic, and so if you just yell something at us, uh, the mic won't pick it up. Maybe that's what you want, but <laughs> it's not what we want. So we're, we're just going to get right into it then. Uh, Kim Coco, you know, you came close in the last two elections. Why do you think this year is going to be different? Well, thank you. Can I just start by thanking you, Blaze, and Civil Beat for hosting this event and not canceling it just because my opponent um, decided not to show up. Um, a PBS, we had one scheduled on PBS Insights, and PBS did choose to cancel that event. Um, so thank you very much for your general, journalistic integrity. Um, I also want to thank um, the team here at Box Jelly for sharing this space with us. Um, Thank you. So why is this race different than uh, the last two races? Um, well, for, for me, um, so it, it's given me more time to meet my neighbors in the Ala Moana Kaka'ako downtown areas, um, to give me more time to meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. I've knocked on, I've, I've hosted this um, within the last six months, I've hosted 55 sidewalk talks and coffee talks uh, in front of buildings um, in, in, on in different communities. Um, you know, I often bring my cart of, with fresh brewed coffee on a Saturday morning. Um, anything to just make sure I, I, voters feel like they can access the individual who wants to meet, who wants to represent them. Um, the state representative um, role is the most intimate between the elected official and um, the voter. It's the smallest jurisdiction, so you should know that individual, that elected person the best out of everyone else. You should have their ear. Um, you should be able to, to speak with them. They should return your phone calls. And one of the things I've been learning um, in, during the past four years that I've been actively campaigning is that um, people don't always feel heard. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm running. But another thing that's different this time, well, I think just people in general, I think people appreciate seeing me work as hard as I do and I'm I'm as committed. It wasn't like I was just trying to see how things would go. I really do love campaigning and I really do, because for me, it's an opportunity to help people. Like I've gotten so many requests for assistance because um, you know one of my signs that I have up when I go, um, when I host my um, sidewalk talks and coffee talks is please, um, how may I help? Um, and I, I do want um, somebody to ask me for assistance, and I've been able to help a lot of people just as a layperson, just as a candidate. Um, I've, I've been serving the people of Hawaii for, for decades now, so I have a lot of access to resources. Um, and so I know where to go for rent relief. I know where to go for if somebody's doing something weird at building, um, I can call people and get them to put pressure um, to help those individuals. Um, so yeah, I think just that's gonna be different. I think third time's the charm. I think people feel that. People, I think, want to root for somebody who, this whole idea of ganbare, you know, this idea that you keep on persevering and you don't, you don't quit, you know? Um, so that's different. I just want to circle back real quick to something you, you might have mentioned a little bit earlier. Do you think after the first election, people might have thought that you were like a one and done candidate? That's why you kept running? Um, no. After When it came so close in 2020. So, I mean, I am running against the Speaker of the House. <laughs> you know, he is a very powerful individual. He's a very moneyed individual. He, he at least in 2022, he um, spent the most in the history of Hawaii to hold on to a state representative seat 
right? I mean, he's moneyed, he's powerful, and yet I came so close, right? So the first year was 166 votes short, and the next year, next election, I was 161 votes short. Um, I, for me, I took it as an affirmation to keep going. Like there is that many people who are interested in hearing my message and having um, the the opportunity to have a, a different kind, a different person representing them. If you win, um, you know, you would be entering a very, very chaotic house. You know, with at that point, there's going to be everyone jockeying for different positions. Where do you see yourself fitting in? I wouldn't, I wouldn't think of it as going into a chaotic house. I would see it as going into a liberated house. The current, I mean, I guess maybe one way of making it look, the current system helps to make it look not so chaotic because there's a lot of control from the top down, right? And if you step out of line and if you look messy and if you confront leadership, then you get punished. Um, there are consequences. Bills might get killed. Um, there's consequences for that. Um, the, I'm pursuing what I want to help make happen for Hawaii is restoring representational democracy. That means there's 51 representatives, and I want everyone to come in with the, their best and brightest ideas, and I almost want us to find out where we all agree, or the majority of people agree, and then I want to work on those solutions first, and then, you know, if uh, where there isn't agreement, let's have, you know, a rigorous debate. Let's talk about the issues. Let's use data. Um, let's make sure we rally the community to um, speak up on issues that affect them, and then from there, then we make decisions. I don't like this idea that uh, committee chairs can kill bills unilater unilaterally. Um, bills that are really important, they can just kill them for, it could be pettiness, it could be um, somebody who, you know, a, a moneyed lobbyist, uh, you know, gave a really huge contribution for 10 years, and now they're, you know, they're asking for this favor so they'll kill a bill behind the scenes. So there's a lot of things that I want to make sure that we have um, legislators who are comfortable signing on, affirming a good government platform, going into the next session, so that the whoever wants to be Speaker of the House, um, and if they're trying to court our vote as one of the 51, right, they need 26 um, members to support their speakership, that they, if there's 26 of us who say we stand for good government first and foremost because it serves the people of Hawaii, um, then they need to lean in to our good government platform, right? If we make an affirmative statement, that doesn't sound like chaos to me. That's do you, but do you think a majority of currently seated House members think the same way you do? You know, if you win, you'd replace one, but there's 50 others still in there, many who have held those seats yeah. for decades, and many of them probably think the same way as the current uh, okay. speaker does. The, those who have held the, their seats for decades are in the minority at this point, and they will be. Do you know what I'm saying? We're increasing the numbers, and hopefully the freshmen from last session um, are, have not been indoctrinated <laughs> enough to the old ways. I think we have an opportunity to, um, to really uh, inspire people to speak up. You know, I mean, I, I want them to see somebody, I don't know if it's courageous or if it's just, I have this conviction. And I also feel like a lot of my passion and what causes me to speak up and speak out is that I feel so grateful for having the support of family and friends. Um, yeah, I, I really, for me, this it's an extension of my community service, and I just want to help, and I want to join others in helping the people of Hawaii. I mean, that's, I feel, that's why everyone who ran for office, it's not easy. It's, it, there's a lot of sacrifices we make to, to campaign, right, a lot of time away from our family. A lot of, you know, in some cases, money and asking family and friends to donate money. That's, that's a lot. So to do all of that and then to get to the house and then to just be told to shut up and, you know, like, don't rock the boat. Yeah. Go along to get along when there's really important work that needs to be done. I have a feeling, a very strong feeling, that a lot of the um, newer, younger legislators will gravitate to that possibility. Do you think there's at least 25 there, though? Um, yes, I do. 
you, you, you mentioned in your candidate Q&A and in other um, forums changes to legislative rules, making the process more transparent, uh, taking away, you know, the sort of power that's concentrated in the House Finance Committee. You know, say there isn't 25, and I'm just making up a scenario here. Say there's 14, 16, 20, mm-hmm. but it doesn't quite get to that, um, you know, threshold to break the log jam, so to speak. You know, how, uh, where do you see yourself maneuvering in that sort of space? Uh, well, I actually am somebody who, um, even if I dis- if we disagree on certain issues, I have no problem working with people who, um, who, quite frankly, who might be transphobic, transphobic, homophobic. They might have different, you know, positions on issues that I care deeply about. But where we agree, I look, I look forward to working with them. You know, when, um, for instance, Mike Gabbard, Senator Mike Gabbard, I've reached out to him and worked with him on environmental issues, even though he has a history and we've had run-ins on other issues, it doesn't matter to me. To me, it's a lu- that's a luxury I feel like Hawaii can't afford, that kind of pettiness. There's a level of pettiness to say, well, you hurt my feelings, you know, 15 years ago. Now I can't work with you on all these issues. And um, that's a luxury that a lot of people in Hawaii can't afford. And it would be, I would think, very arrogant of me to put that kind of personal um, petty thing in front of doing the work to benefit the people of Hawaii. Uh, for, for those of you who just walked in, welcome, welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. Grab a musubi if you haven't already. And also, if just to remind the crowd, if you have any questions for Kim Coco, uh, grab an index card and you can write your question down there. Hand it to someone in a Civil Beat shirt and they'll make sure it gets to me so I can ask it. Uh, one, what, one other question um, on, the, on the legislature and the organization before I move on to another topic. Who would that quote-unquote good government speaker be, do you think? Well, it would be somebody who, you know, wants to make sure that, um, and will they come out affirmatively and say, you know, if we have a bill introduced and if 20, at least 25 of the representatives sign on as a co-introducer or co-sponsor, we will make sure that bill gets a hearing, at least the first hearing in the first committee. Like that would be a change. And if they say, you know what, we're also going to change some of the rules that we voluntarily subscribe to ourselves, um, to say that um, if there's a conflict of interest, if there's a financial conflict of interest, it will not be waived by the by the speaker that financial conflict of interest will go to the ethics commission for them to determine whether or not the individual legislature legislator should vote or speak out on a particular issue so i served on the board of education and we were controlled by the the state ethics laws and also by the state sunshine law so i have experienced at least for five years in working it with that kind of uh, good government uh, safeguard to avoid to avoid uh, corruption because that is an act to me that's an act of corruption if you're financially benefiting and you're making uh, you're voting on an issue that affects you personally or your household personally at the detriment of the people of Hawaii that's a conflict and you should not uh, partake in that. You should recuse yourself as I did when I was on the Board of Education and an issue came up where there was a conflict. We could do that, it's not impossible, but I'd, right now the current leadership leaves that, that rule in there where he can just wave and say no conflict when clearly the person just admitted there was a conflict. I, I guess I was wondering if you would name any names that you were thinking of. Well, I, I feel it's for the individual leader I mean, leading means you're leading a group of people and that they, you know, and for them to get your votes. I'm hoping that they will st- stand up and say, this is who I am. This is what I'll do uh, for representational democracy in Hawaii. I don't, um, I, you know, it depends who gets elected and depends and who's, who rises to that challenge. Well, why do you think the incumbent is vulnerable? Oh, well, I think the I think it's in the the number of votes um, that he's um, gotten in terms of vulnerable to the to the voters. Do you mean the the vote the results of the election yes. in the past? Um, 
Well, I think, well, he's been there for 30 years. <laughs> Let's start there. I think a majority of Hawaii, um, you know, with all the polls that Civil Beat has done, right, it's been consistently the, pe the, the residents and the voters of Hawaii want term limits. And he, the, my opponent has blocked um, the voters from voting on term limits uh, for state legis the state legislature. So that's, a, I think that's a problem. So I think this is one way, obviously, if you vote him out, that is a term limit you're imposing on somebody who's been there for 15 terms already. Um, so that's, um, so that could be one of the things. Um, I think um, he's, um, you know, he has, I think people see the way he leads. And again, I'm not there to see everything, but I do read Civil Beat. And you guys have done a really good job covering the the insider shenanigans that goes on at the legislature. And uh, so I thank you so much for your your, your journalism and covering the pay-to-play politics uh, that you've covered personally. I've really appreciated reading what you've read, what you've written. So I'm getting my information from where a lot of the voters get their information, and the conclusion I've been made I've made um, is that uh, that you know that he there is a little bit of you know autocracy in the way he he leads, um, and um, when people step out of line, and and one of the instances that was really clear to me, which actually initiated me to to run it. In, in 2020 was when he, um, I guess he had a meeting with the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii and they decided in 2020 before session started that they were not gonna raise the minimum wage out of poverty wages. He just proclaimed it, he had a press, re press conference and he said, I met with the Chamber of Commerce, we're not gonna raise um, minimum wage this year. And I'm like, wait a minute. So I called up all of my friends in the legislature. I said, did you guys caucus on this? Did he pull you guys on to determine whether or not um, you guys are going to address minimum wage this session. And they said, no, he never, this never came up. So it was really clear to me that he was making a lot of these decisions all on his own. And, you know, it's been reported. So I, th I feel like people are, um, maybe we have to have change. Maybe that isn't the best for thing for Hawaii. I'm, I'm going to move on to... Um since I got a question about it, and I had a few questions of my own on onto housing, this uh, this audience member is asking: the middle class is falling into despair and find it difficult to live, survive, and thrive in Hawaii. How could you help working families to remain in affordable housing? Right, that is the number one um, housing insecurity in general. Housing insecurity, both with condo owners having you know facing huge financial burdens with um, insurance skyrocketing um, but also when when I mean so this is this is where trickle down does happen uh, trickle this is the actual part of trickle down economics when people who own condos are paying more for their condos than the people they're renting like so I rent at um, Koula and so my landlord did say my 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 maintenance fees are going up and your rents going up I'm like okay so that's what that's real that's what's happening but you're also getting at the Individuals who may be re renting already, who are already in a in what's deemed as affordable housing. Um, I spoke to um, uh, some kapuna at um, Hale Kalele on the new, the new beautiful one right on Pii Koi, right before King Street. Their raises, even though they had to income qualify to get into that building because it's affordable, their rents are now going up 15% every two years. And that's and that means like 30% increase in, in four years. And they're like, wait a minute, they know how much money, they know how much money I have. How are they raising our rent? Um, so and and so that becomes an issue. They're scared. They're like, wait, is there anything? after affordable housing, like they, they're imagining that they're gonna be homeless. And so they're paying for their rent by taking money out of their food budget. And one of the things that we've learned is that one out of every three households are now food insecure, um, which actually goes very, it actually follows the data that 28% of Hawaii's residents pay more than 50% of their income. More than half of their income goes to housing. I mean, that is not sustainable. 
one of the things that I would like to do to address that is we what we do know is that 40% of all private property in Hawaii is owned by out-of-state investors. 40% owned by out-of-state investors. And that's led to, now we, according to the 2020 census, we have, I think, around... How do we know that? Um, well, it's said, uh, how do we know that? Have you researched that or are you just, I mean, no, no, no I'm asking how do we know? Cause I don't know that, but how, how where does the 40% figure come from? Oh yeah. Well, it comes from the, yeah, the, where you look at the property records, you see who, who owns all the private, all private property has a, has a database of who owns which private property. I guess, like, was it like a state study, a city study? Oh, it's been yeah. reported multiple. Oh, okay. I mean, if, if somebody wants to Google this, and then by the time. Any type of uh, property tax website for the state, you can find right. it. And, and, and like Zillow as well. Yeah, can, sorry. Z okay. Yeah, so thank you. Sorry. I, I, I took it for granted that it was just common knowledge, but thank you. I don't have the citation, but I'm sure somebody can get it. Hopefully, you'll fact check. My, my discussion. And so what it's led to is um, in the 2020 census, they've identified more than 70,000 empty homes. And I'm not saying all of these foreign investor properties are now empty. And in fact, some local um, land uh, owners might choose to keep their, their investment properties empty as well. But regardless, there's more than 70,000 empty homes across the state. Um, when people are not living, when people are keeping units empty, and say, say you and I live in one of these units and the, our neighbor in the middle between our units, it's empty, no one's there, but you and I live there. We go out into the community, we buy a coffee here at Box Jelly, we go grocery shopping at Whole Foods, we eat at Merriman's, we're actually spending money, we're paying GET tax, we're creating jobs, and those individuals who, who have jobs are paying income tax, right? So there's state revenue that's being generated because you and I live here, spend money here, we, um, every day, and so if we were to collect an empty home surcharge based on the loss revenue that this investor decided to keep us from, from collecting, right? So this investor is keeping the state from collecting this revenue because they won't rent out or occupy their unit. Meanwhile, we have many, many families moving to Vegas, um, so they're spending their money there, uh, but they're not spending money here and that unit is empty. So we can collect, we can calculate which the square footage of the condo, for instance, we can calculate what the equivalent um, tax revenue that would have been generated had that person been living, spending money in the community. Um, so collecting that revenue, we can use that revenue to subsidize housing vouchers so that Kapuna don't have to worry about going homeless. Um, so that's one of the things we can actually, right now we only have one, um, one um, bed, one temporary bed for every two unhoused or unsheltered individuals. So we need to also address that issue um, and also you know, use that money for more social workers so that we're getting um, our unsheltered neighbors the services that they need to hopefully get out of homelessness. Um, so there's a lot we can do with that revenue that we're just leaving on the table. Who would need to do that, talking about the empty home surcharge, who would need to do that analysis because, you know, it's like property taxes is usually right. handled by the city or, or the counties, excuse me, the state has a different set right. of things, you know, who who comes in and does that if that sort of thing becomes a law? Well, right now, the city and county, they are, um, they are commissioning a study um, for their city and county. If they were to impose an empty homes uh, tax, they can do that because they can tax property. But what I'm saying is we're actually collecting a surcharge on lost tax revenue, right? So, so it's different. You're saying this is in addition to any county level empty home. You know, if that's, yeah, yeah. If, I mean, if that fits, right? Because we've, we, those of us who live here, we pay taxes. So we've paid for the state infrastructure for that out of state investor to keep their unit empty. And when they sell their unit, they'll be making a profit. But we, you and I, because we're the ones paying the tax. We've paid for all the state infrastructure that allowed them to make that profit. So, um, yes, yeah, so I would definitely collect that, that 
that tax revenue and then deploy it where it needs to so that we're not necessarily increasing taxes on local residents. Do you, do you think it makes sense to have a statewide empty homes tax, sort of like what the city and county is proposing, but apply that, you know, statewide? Well, we, like this, okay, so to answer the question, the state does invest, right? The state does put out a recent money. We spend money on state infrastructure, certain roads, certain well, infrastructure in general, all the services that a state provides that foreign investors um, are able to profit from the existence of that infrastructure. For instance, if you had a condo in the middle of the desert or a house in the middle of the desert and there was no government infrastructure anywhere, I mean, what, how much money are you going to make versus having a, a nice condo here in the middle of a thriving urban core, a lot of the infrastructure that we've, you and I have paid for? Yeah. Uh, going back to the condos real quick, you know, uh, the condo owners have told us that they're just getting, you know, walloped by these rising insurance rates and these rising insurance costs. So what could the state do to help alleviate that? Well, the state could have listened, sorry, the state could have listened to condo advocates. Condo advocates, and they've shown me their emails, they have been putting the state, the DCCA, legislators on notice since 2016. They've been saying there's going to be an economic financial crisis. We need to change the condo laws. You need to put things in place. Um, we need greater oversight of the insurance commissioner. He needs to, we need to come up with the regulation because insurance is a regulated industry. So what, do, it's, so it's the job of the insurance commissioner to regulate. What are they regulating? if not rates, right? When the PUC, the PUC regulates, and when, if HECO wants to raise rates, they have to open up their books and show us why they gotta raise the rates. Same thing for Young Brothers. If Young Brothers, so those are both regulated industries, if Young Brothers wants to jack up fees for shipping, then they need to show the justification. Where has that happened for condo insurance? And if not, why hasn't it? And, and how, what can we do? What can legislators do? What can people who are supposed to be looking out for us, what can they do to, to make sure that that is happening? Um, there is also, so for condo insurance specifically, there is um, a, progr uh, a program that was created by statute in 1976 um, called the Hawaii Insurance Guarantee Association. It, it, so it's a statutorily authorized nonprofit um, that collects premium, a portion of the premiums that condo owners, um, that insurance carriers collect and then uh, collect from uh, condo owners. A portion of that money goes into this Hawaii Insurance Guarantee Association fund. So it's called HIGA, into this HIGA fund. And the fund is there and it operates like FDIC insurance for your bank account. What it is is if, if an insurance company, if an insurance carrier goes belly up and they leave all of these policyholders shafted, um, the HIGA kicks in and covers them. Right, so we want to make sure we have a robust HIGA in case something happens, because that's what all the insurance companies, they're trying to insure against something bad is happening, gonna happen, something worse is gonna happen, so we need to make sure we raise premiums so we have enough to cover. The same is true for this HIGA that the state has. Um, other states, so our HIGA has maybe 25 million. Other states of similar size, like New Hampshire, has 50 million in their HIGA account. Florida. It's much bigger. Um, they have around $676 million in their HIGA account. But we got we to put more money in that and make sure that that is um, fortified. And also the Hurricane Relief Fund. Back in uh, the 90s, um, when Hurricane uh, Iniki struck and it left people without hurricane insurance or the ability to cover their properties, the state jumped into action. Within nine months, they created the Hurricane Relief Fund for Hawaii. And so where there's a will, there's a way. They can act and they can do it. But so why haven't they? Yeah. You know, my opponent failed to to get a bill through that would have um, that would have um, allowed for this kind of protection for condo owners. And again, it's been a history of ignoring the condo advocates who've been trying to come to the legislature and get an ombudsman, try to get a cap on attorneys' fees. Um, you know, when when um, associations try to collect like a you know a five dollar um, late fee and they end up spending five thousand dollars in attorneys' fees, that's ridiculous. Um, 
other areas it's capped and and you guys did a great um um you guys did a great thing on condo issues a great town hall on condo issues and i learned a lot from that and so looking at all those simple fixes and the fact that it's not been done year after year and then i look at who's why aren't the lawmakers doing something for the condo owners and I'm like, wait a minute, um, who's giving, who's putting all this money into the legislators' campaign accounts? It's developers, it's campaign management companies, it's attorneys who make money off of these crazy fees that they charge and impose on individual condo owners. So, you know, that's why, I mean, I, I would conclude that that is partly the pay-to-play politics of what's happening of why condo owners have been and ignored for so long um, because the attention and the favor has been slanted towards um, all of those moneyed interests who make money and then who cycle that money back to legislators. And this is an opportunity right now for condo owners in this district and they represent over 50% of the voters in our district. I went through the entire Q public database and looked at it in comparison to our voter database and 50% of our voters who vote are condo owners and they've been ignored by our current representative. And I'm hoping that they see that I've been paying attention. I've been working with condo owners for the last two years. I've been, um, yeah, working uh, c uh, together with them as allies and, and trying to push some of these c um, corrections um, to, to um, a lot of disappointment and frustration. Uh, I wanted to ask you about camping cash in a little bit, but sticking on the topic of condo owners, you know, mm -hmm. a, a lot of the condo owners that Civil Beats talk to, some of them are really elderly. You know, I'm sort of thinking of that one woman who who had that really long legal battle over something that seemed to be pretty manini that, to start with. You know, what, what can be done to protect, uh, you know, residents like that? Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm – and that's really one of the reasons why I find this condo um, – the condo issue to be so um, – so worthy of of everyone's attention is because a lot of people think oh condo owners these every the wealthy condo owners i'm like no there's a lot of retirees who purchase the condo because it's they're like oh it's safe and predictable right um it's not like owning a home and something can happen and all the all the financial pressure is put on you as an individual all of these retired all these retired individuals who are on limited incomes think, thought to themselves that this is a safe and secure and stable um, place to, to live and to plan their financial longevity. And it's turning out to be really uh, horrible for them. And, they, and they're like, wait a minute, as the maintenance fees go up and it flips, it's usually the mortgage is smaller and the maintenance, well, the, mor the mortgage is larger and the maintenance fee is smaller. Now it's flipping. So now the maintenance fees, who's going to want to buy it? So they're being told if you can't afford the maintenance fees, then you should move out. You should sell your place and move out. And they're like, who's going to want to buy this unit and how much equity will it leave me? And will it leave me enough equity to take somewhere to actually have a home? Or to have a place to live, like where do I go next? You know, is the same. So this is going to create a logjam, um, and then we, we. So we need some serious attention, and we need to get the best and brightest um, people in in the room thinking about this issue, putting together some strategies and some solutions, and looking at other jurisdictions, what's worked in other places. Uh, moving on to another audience question. This is about cannabis. The current medical cannabis system is guided and run by eight owners. Uh, would you support a medical program that supports small local businesses and provides access to medicine to the people of Hawaii? And if, I, if I'm understanding what this uh, audience member is trying to get at, I, I think what they're talking about is expanding it possibly mm -hmm. beyond those eight owners into smaller uh, farms. I think I've seen proposals like that in, in the legislature recently. Right. Um, and this ca question came up to me from a, another um, voter I spoke to earlier today. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the the feds are in the process of uh, deregulating or moving down the controlled substance um, the schedule. It's making it a lesser scheduled um, narcotic or drug. So it's going to be more along the lines of, um, of medical grade, like ibuprofen or something. But they're bringing it down. So what's going to happen is the feds are decriminalizing. De they're making it more, they're going to make it more available. 
I think we need to get ahead of this because once the feds say, okay, it's open and available to everyone, it's going to be really hard to get that back under control. So, But if we are a state that gets out in front of it and says we need to figure out how to regulate, we need to figure out how to tax, we need to figure out who gets to grow it, how we're going to grow it safely, um, what kind of regulation, what kind of labeling requirements do we want. Um, all of these things should be done proactively. Um, so. And so that's what I would, I would be a proponent of that, of seeing how this can unfold. And we're going to be stuck going, oh, well, we didn't see this one coming either. Of course we did. We've been telling you it's coming. And so let's get ready. Let's be, let's be smart and avoid the, 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 the downfalls. One of the benefits that I could see by actually um, addressing who gets to grow um, who gets to grow um, recreational, uh, responsible adult use recreational marijuana or cannabis um, would be, I would start with the farmers who are currently growing food for local consumption. The farmers, maybe there's a farmer with 10 acres um, growing produce of food that we eat here locally. If they just allocated one acre to marijuana, they could subsidize the nine acres of food. It is so costly for labor, for water, for all of these things to move food um, within our state. If they can make use, capture the million dollar per acre profits off cannabis to sell, we could have food security. It would be amazing. We could feed everyone. People would be incentivized to be farmers, but I would definitely start with those farmers who are currently feeding the people of Hawaii right now and not let um, mainland corporate monocropping people come in and try to take grow get all the permits to grow and keep it all in one area and they collect all the profits and then what will happen is i'm afraid anyone who is involved in agriculture will go let's go work for them and they would just abandon all the food production so we need to be smart we need to think about ways of boosting up our food our food system here in hawaii instead of creating a competitor to our food system you mentioned farming subsidies in your candidate Q and A. What sorts of subsidies do you think farmers should be getting? Uh, well, I was—I think I was trying to be coy, <laughs> not saying you know giving them the grow permits, but that's the subsidy. We wouldn't actually have to give them money. We're allowing them to subsidize themselves by growing this um, very profitable crop. So that's the subsidy that we'd be giving them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, like, sort of allowing the, more of these permits to go out to incentivize farming. To farmers who are far farming, already farming. making food for local production. Would it only be limited to people who are already growing um, food? I would start or there. Could it be expanded to people who, you know, just want to get into the marijuana business? It could be. So, you could create a co-op, for instance. Like, somebody can say... As long as the ratio is one one acre of cannabis to nine acres of food being grown for local consumption, um, I think you can create a co-op where somebody comes in and manages that part, but then the money gets used to subsidize, and this is where the subsidy comes in, to subsidize all of the very expensive costs of growing food um, in Hawaii. Uh, I wanted to ask you about citizens' initiative. You know, many many candidates that we have asked about this over the years, they've either gone, you know, absolutely yes or absolutely not. Uh, your answer was a little bit more nuanced, uh, with some guardrails that you'd want to see in place. Could you talk a little bit about that? Right, and I and I think it's really important that we look at everything critically and not just knee jerk. No, knee jerk. Yes, let's let's get nuanced. Let's find how we can move something forward and get all the benefits from it while putting guardrails to make sure we don't get the, the really horrible parts of a, of a citizen's initiative process. So yes, I, I basically, and I think I was opposed to citizens um, because of all of the corporate corruption here, you know, all of the moneyed interests and the role of money, what they're doing to legislators, could they do through purchasing commercials and media and all of you know that to shape and, and the way the voters might vote on an issue? And what 
it's made me more confident that the citizens have actually, you know, they've they've rallied together on so many issues, like the women's movement, uh, young people fighting for our environment, young people fighting for safe um, gun regulation, um, young people fighting for, um, you know, um, yeah, for for again, the environment, but also then we have Black Lives Matter, we have the Mauna Kea movement, the Aloha Aina movement, everyone's rallying and coming together in their communities and rising up. And that feels like, yes, we can do the citizens initiative process. Uh, and then now to the guardrails, how do we make sure that we don't uh, remove any kind of constitutional protection? protections how do we make well, like what is the threshold for is it so I propose a super majority of voters I propose that they cannot abridge any existing constitutional rights I think those are fair and reasonable um, but but then the people the citizens could vote on term limits that would be totally appropriate because right now um, as the current the current um, who's in control of the legislature, they're not going to approve term, the, the voters having a vote on term limits. Yeah. Well, what do, you, what do you think is a reasonable, you know, uh, level of term limits? Is it eight years? Is it 10? Well, it's definitely not 15 terms. <laughs> uh, it's definitely not 30 years. Um, you know, I would say it's a, maybe half that. <laughs> no, maybe for the Senate, it should be something, you know, uh, like more like 12 or you know, 16 years, and then for the house, maybe something like 10 years. And I just want to share with you, so when I was on the Board of Education, I was there for uh, five years, and it felt urgent. Knowing that somebody's coming in as an eighth grader and they would be graduating by the time you're done with your term, like you lost all ability to impact and improve education for that student. You know what I mean? There's this lack of urgency right now, and it's maddening. It's like people think that because they can stay there, they're just going to protect the status quo, don't rock the boat. <laughs> and what's happening is and the thing, problems have just come and they've fermented and gotten you know ripe and spoiled and now we're dealing with the homelessness the way we see it you know we're dealing with housing insecurity the way we're experiencing that I mean too many things have gotten um, ignored because we don't have a sense of urgency or a sense of responsiveness to the problems that exist in in real time you know so that's um that's why I think term limits. I think we need to have a sense of your time is limited, so get to work, get it done, and get out. And also build up leadership. You know, how are you mentoring the next generation? You, you just brought up homelessness, and I know it's one of those big issues. It's mm -hmm. complicated. It's not something that you could fix in a day. But you know, a lot of the communities here have been experiencing it for a number of years, and they're clamoring for solutions. If you're elected, what's one proposal you would put forward that could help alleviate, start alleviating homelessness? You know rather immediately, right. sooner well, rather than later. Yeah, I think um, Governor Green has done a great job on, I think he's done the best job out of any governor so far on the issues of homelessness. I do support the Kauhale, this idea of safe zones. In fact, the neighborhood board that I'm on, and there's some neighborhood board members here for the Alamona Kaka'ako area, we just voted to um, adopt a resolution that would support a Kauhale here in our community, um, possibly at the um, Kaka'ako Gateway Park that kind of perpendicularly intersects Ala Moana, a park that not many people are using, but could be a safe place where we can make sure there are resources and social workers and food and, and clean water and toilets um, and uh, even washing machines because if somebody's going to get a job, um, even at McDonald's, you need, to, you need to smell clean, you need to have clean clothes. You, uh, you need to have the right shoes. And so there's a lot of services that we can offer if everyone's kind of in one place. Um, and it's not the best situation, but it's temporary. Um, it's someplace identifiable um, that we can, we can partner with businesses in the community, um, with health agencies, and we can actually do much more. But then long term, 
the empty homes surcharge and then directing and deploying um, those resources, real money to, um, to that effort. But also we need to make sure there's more than one temporary shelter bed for every two unsheltered people. We need to make sure there's at least two temporary shelter beds for every two unsheltered people. We're setting ourselves up. This is why we see law enforcement or different agencies moving our unsheltered neighbors from one sidewalk to the other because there really is no temporary shelter bed. We've not increased, we've not increased that supply and it's been stagnant. And in fact, I have one of the, um, so I participate in the point in time count every year. It's where volunteers and social workers and different agencies go into the community and you actually approach every single unsheltered individual and you ask them a series of questions. Um, you know, like, were you homeless as a, as a child? And 24% of them had experienced homelessness as a child. And it helps you understand then what kind of services and why we need certain services to address their needs. Um, many of us here, we, um, we have a safety net maybe a family um, that can help us out if we're in dire financial distress. But if you come from a family who, you know, where homelessness was a, a common experience, and you might think for yourself that, well, homelessness is an option as an adult, and also I have no one to count on, no one to support me in getting getting off the street. So I think that really, um, that data is important. Um, but what that data is also showing us is that um, the, we've made certain laws and passed certain policies in Hawaii that's made it harder. So the limited number of shelter space we have now we used to have more um, individuals who, this is the, so this shows that before 60% of, of our homeless population was sheltered and 40% was unsheltered, meaning they were on the sidewalk and now it's flipped. Now we have 62% uh, who are unsheltered, where 38% are actually they're, they are in a shelter situation. And one of the reasons why that's happened is because we've authorized shelters to, to, um, to be more rigid about their rules. Um, for some, and one of my adult foster kids, I've, I've been a foster kid to, to um, young people who've experienced homelessness um, or incarceration. And so they experience it in and out as adults as well. Um, but one of them told me, yeah, if they go to IHS, they, they're gonna mandate her to use, to get injected with a drug or to go on medication. That's gonna control her anger possibly. But she said that when I'm on it, it makes, it, it drops my defenses and if somebody has hands me a crack pipe, it, I don't hesitate to pick to use it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it's kind of like, wait a minute, you're f requiring her to do this m drug that's gonna make her more open to doing other drugs and she's trying to be clean. And so she then, she's like, okay, I can't go to that shelter anymore. I gotta go, you know, in Thomas Square Park. Yeah. And so that's what's happening. That's what we're seeing. The, the numbers of homeless might be stagnant, but we're creating a situation where it's much harder for them to seek help in a, in a shelter that fits their needs. While you were out there doing the point in time count and talking to folks on the streets, what were some of the things you learned that surprised you? Uh, well, that 24% um, experienced homelessness as a, as a child, um, that 12% actually have jobs. 12% of the unsheltered individuals are working. Um, I also have an apartment building in the district on Birch Street, and 50% um, of my, ten at least half of my units are housing previously homeless families or families that would be homeless but for their Section 8. Um, and so one of the first families, he was a gentleman living in his, um, in his van with three kids and he had a job, but he wasn't able to make enough because of, he was always worried about his kids and they were living in a van. Once he got stabilized housing, within the first year he got four raises and he was able to pay his full rent and was no longer eligible for subsidies. Um, so yeah, stabilized housing will have an impact on somebody being, being able to hold a job. And um, so that's, so all of these data points are really important. You mentioned setting up a kohale um, in this district and having like a sort of runaway mic, <laughs> not having a runaway mic, but having ha having that kohale also complemented with sort of like a wraparound service centers. 
and you know in, in other communities and i'm not saying that this is happening here but in other communities sometimes when those are proposed have gotten a lot of pushback from the community you know if that sort of thing happens here yes how do you navigate that? well we understood that when we um the um the the homelessness czar i guess for the county of uh, honolulu and also the state uh, point person on homelessness we both came to our neighborhood board and basically um, we, uh, through a discussion that we all had together we're like oh they need cover like they want to do this but we the neighborhood board members, we need to put something together that gives them cover to act on this so that if the neighbors get all up in arms and all not in our backyard, well, I mean, which is ridiculous because they're on our front doorstep, right? So, you know, isn't it better to have them somewhere where, you know, it, it's kind of everyone agrees that maybe it's better here than right here? And so, um, so that's what we we said. Let's do this and let's give them cover to act proactively, um, solve this this crisis that's happening in our district. And um, the vote, I think, it passed unanimously. Right. And so, and we agreed that all of the neighborhood board members that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take the heat if people get mad. And 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 because we want to make sure we're giving cover to the city and county and the state to actually invest these resources to help people and meet them where they're at. Uh, just one question on tourism. There's been a lot of talk about these so-called green fees for tourists uh, coming up recently proposed by Governor Green. Well, what form should a green fee take, do you think, and how should it be implemented? Yeah, well, I think a green fee makes sense because tourists are impacting our environment. They're impacting our infrastructure. Um, a green fee also allows, um, and I would actually like there to be a green fee for the state as well as for the counties um, to impose their own green fee. I, I actually see potentially the green fee or even a TAT as being a kind of a spigot where counties can control how many um, tourists they want uh, coming into their county. What is their carrying capacity of their community for tourists? Um, the, the way tourists are coming in now. And I think they have um, given them that ability. Um, and if one county wants more tourists, then maybe they bring their green fee and their TAT lower. And if one county wants fewer tourists because they have other economic opportunities that they want to focus on, then they can choose that on a more local level. We've gotten a question like this at almost all of the pop-ups have done, but it has to do with conference committee. Uh, this is from an audience member. They're saying the legislative process is opaque, with chairs having the ability to unilaterally you know, kill bills with little explanation, uh, sometimes without public input. How would he change this, especially during conference? Uh, yes. Well, there's uh, there's several things. <laughs> One is um, everything needs to, obviously, people need to be able to review th what's being voted on and there's a lot of times where they're voting and it, the full the full um, bill hasn't been circulated and they're just being told they're expected to vote and pass it through because that's the pressure some of them some of the committee chairs may hold a bill of yours until you pass this bill do you know what I mean? All of that playing, I, I think, is contrary to good government uh, reforms that we want to see. So that's the first step, is making sure that there is none of this horse trading, that people actually do what's right. Um, and uh, everyone has time to review the, the breadth of the bill and its impacts. So one of the, the things I think I responded to in my Star Advertiser questionnaire, uh, or maybe it was Civil Beat, but this idea of having an office at the legislature that looks at the impacts, the financial impacts of every bill. For instance, if you're doing mandatory minimums for certain crime, if you want to extend sentencing, then somebody needs to do the calculation of how much more money that's going to cost the Department of Public Safety to house people longer, right? There's a financial impact for everything. Um, what is the financial impact of incarcerating somebody instead of actually giving them training or therapy or drug treatment? Um, you know, when you put two solutions next to each other and you look at, you extrapolate the economic impact, the cost to government as well as to society, is there a way that we can quantify that and 
look at the data. So all of these things would be safeguards against reckless. There's been a lot of reckless um, bills that have come out of conference because it all happens at the last minute and then, and then there are cuts to programs and we're like, oh, how did that program get cut? Well, you voted on that. You voted on that budget. Oh, I didn't realize that. Oh, okay. You know, that's not acceptable. Uh, this is another audience question. Would you support abrogating qualified immunity? And I'm assuming they're talking about qualified immunity for government employees. Abrogating, meaning remove qualified immunity. Like, I think specifically, are they referring to cops who have really grossly inappropriate... Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah. So I do support removing uh, qualified immunity. If it's outside of their scope of training, if they've, you know, if it's outside of everything that they've been told to do, then how is it that they get qualified immunity for doing contrary to their training, contrary to the standards of conduct? And I, I would I would say yes, that would apply true not just to the cops and but to also to department heads, to everyone else who's put in a position to carry out a duty and they just go off in their own way and um and and they do something that's illegal that causes harm or death. Uh, yeah, there should be consequences, absolutely. And if anyone has any other questions, keep them coming. Uh, grab an index card at the front and hand your question to a uh, person in a civil beat. Uh, shirt and they'll hand them over to me to uh, ask him Coco. But another question of mine uh, has to do with the Sunshine Law. Mm. Do you think the Sunshine Law should be applied to the legislature? And if so, uh, how? Would it be the entire Sunshine Law or parts of it? To well, there's the a lot. Process? So there's the there's Sunshine Law, but there's also the State Ethics Commission. Um, you know, I don't know if you know this, but legislators, they uh, amended the law to say that they themselves are not state employees, which is ridiculous because they get all the benefits of being a state employee. Um, and how they do that and how they get away with that is, uh, you know, it's a crime. Um, so, But they've done it. And so not only have they exempted themselves from the Sunshine Law, but also the State Ethics Commission. Um, and so re regarding the Sunshine Law, um, yeah, bodies make decisions all the time in the public eye and where there's transparency. Every single one of our county councils um, operate under the Sunshine Law. Um, the Board of Education operated under the Sunshine Law. Um, and um, I think we can get a lot done. Um, somebody said that if we're going to do a full Sunshine Law exposure, then we should have a full full year-round legislature. And maybe I would, I would be OK with that as long as we could also um, prohibit people from having outside jobs, which brings up a whole nother issue, which is um, lawmakers who are also private practice attorneys. <laughs> Have you heard about that? There are lawmakers who actually are attorneys in private practice. And there is a law that you cannot disclose who your clients are. When you're an attorney, you cannot tell people, the public, who your clients are and what kind of representation you're providing to a particular client. So that's what kind of services, you're, legal services you're giving them and who the individual is. If Kalani English and Ty Cullen were attorneys, that little envelopes of cash that they received could have been legally accepted as retainers for legal services. I just want to, do you hear what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, so why aren't there safeguards around that? In fact, the um, I drafted a resolution that was adopted by the Democratic Party of Hawaii in 2022 that actually had that provision in there that was addressed. It was as urging the legislature to stop corruption. And that was one of the points that the Democratic Party voted on and passed. We sent it over to the legislature and they ignored it. They ignored this idea that legislative leaders, if you're in private practice, that you should not hold a leadership position because no one knows who's paying you to do what, you know? And so, and it, cause it would be against the law for the attorney to disclose that. Um, so for that reason, you, there is no, and so they implemented a law like, oh, if you're a lobbyist, you have to disclose what bills you're advocating for. Wait a minute, if you're an attorney and in a leadership position at the ledge, you need to tell us, you, you can't, you, because you cannot tell us, because attorney-client privilege is a national standard, right? So Hawaii can't force that when it's a national standard. Um, anyway, so that's one of the problems.
I, I got a question about cesspools, and this person, this person is asking, would as many tourists fly to Hawaii if they knew we had so many cesspools? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that is a... Uh... The fact that so many of our beaches get that notification of fecal matter is so gross, right? I mean, I, I, I'm not sure how many cesspools are in this district. We were just in, you know, the North Shore. Yeah, That's a huge problem that they're dealing right. with. But what do you, what do you think should be um, done to? But it's definitely an to, issue that impacts our state, right? right? If it's going to have an economic impact, if it's going to have a health impact, I don't care that it doesn't necessarily impact the residents of our district. We are all making policy that affects the whole state. Right. I was just going to ask you, what do you think should be done to you know, alleviate the cesspool problem? Well, I think we need to figure out ways. Of what, is, what is the problem with getting them replaced? Is it the cost? Is there a way that we can, is there a loan payment program that we can help them with to spread out the costs over many, many years? Um, we, we definitely know that we need to address this sooner than later, right? We don't want them waiting to save up money and then doing it after 30 years when they finally have enough money. We should create a, a financial system where they can get that, set that open, exposed, um, sewer system into a, a contained system now as soon as possible. So whatever we can do, whether it's creating kind of a loan lien situation for their property that they pay off over time, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm open to solutions, but it's something that we need to act on sooner than later. Uh, speaking of the environment, uh, this person is asking, how is the state going to comply with the settlement in Navahine versus Hawaii DOT? I think this is the one brought by, um, uh, uh, not minors, but... Yeah, young people. Yeah, right, young, young people, people against the transportation department. Right, and I think, well, they settled, right? So the young people, their voice was heard. And this is what I was getting about the, about the Citizens Initiative. Like, the fact that they did that, the fact that the young people found their power and their voice, and they said, we demand a future um, that we can live and thrive in. We want clean water. We want clean air. We're inheriting this toxic morass that uh, that you're leaving us. You need to do better. I appreciate that. Is I'm so inspired by their leadership. So they've already settled. Like they're going to move forward on that. And I think uh, they got the commitment of the governor and obviously his administration to implement. And I know that they would ho they will hold the government accountable for fulfilling the terms of the settlement. And I will stand in solidarity with that effort. Where does that money come from, given that, you know, we're paying for uh, the, the wildfire disaster is still paying for that. There's a lot of other expenses going on. So are you saying that that tax cut, that historic tax cut was was uh, incorrect or I, reckless? I, I didn't think about it until you mentioned it. But yeah, since we passed a huge tax cut, where are we going to pay for those settlements? Right. Well, that whole tax cut was, a, you know, everyone knows, I assume everyone knows that it's an election year stunt. Um, there's no way the, the government employee unions like HSTA and HGA would applaud a tax cut worth $5 billion when we already have $28 billion in unfunded liabilities, right? I mean, why would the union, unless legislative leaders say, come on, give me the endorsement. Don't worry, we're going we're gonna to fix the tax cut. We're going to increase it next session. I mean, do we imagine it turning out any differently? Not one voter I've spoken to has been fooled by this tax cut. No one, no one said, oh my God, I'm so grateful we're going to get this tax cut, this imaginary tax cut. And what's really horrible is that they're showing these graphics that show eight years. In eight years, you're going to save $20,000. That's all shibai. That's all kabuki. It's all made up. You know what I mean? And the fact that they're, they're treating voters like they're, they're, like they're done, it's just insulting. It's insulting. Uh, this other audience, sorry, this other audience question is on housing. Housing for who is your priority? I think they're asking, you yeah. know, who who should be getting the housing here? <laughs> well, obviously, um, I, I, I don't think, well, I think we're all concerned with the people uh, who 
can't afford housing to be housed. I mean, I feel like the 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 wealthiest among us are going to be fine. You know, I think they're going to figure it out. They're going to find a way. It's those people who are on reti limited retirement incomes, um, who are struggling to to stay in Hawaii. People who want to be the future of Hawaii. They want to stay here and um, be part of this building this community. We need to make sure there's housing for young people who are just starting off in their careers and their education. Um, that they are that there's a way for them to afford to stay in her here in Hawaii. Um, and so yeah. So those two groups, I guess, uh, Kapuna, the young families, young people, we need to make sure they all have housing that they can afford and not this fake affordable housing. Yeah. And if you have any other questions, keep them coming. Uh, I, I had another on ethics. You know, a lot of candidates have talked about wanting to end the pay to play, ban campaign contributions from contractors and people tied to contractors. How do you convince a majority of the House to do that if it's still making up a significant amount of um, okay, you know, so clean elections. Is it partly about clean elections? So let's be really clear. Clean elections was introduced by my opponent, and it got front page above the fold headlines for this. Meanwhile, I read Civil Beat's kind of um, post, um, post mortem autopsy on what happened to clean elections. And what I read and what I know to be true is the, the speaker, any speaker of the House, can introduce a bill to look like they're supporting what the public wants. And behind the scenes, they can kill the bill. They can put pressure on committee chairs to kill the bill. Like, everyone knows that. So what do you, I mean, and so I felt like that's what your, the article from Civil Beat was trying to say without saying it. Um, and I'm not afraid of saying it, <laughs> because I, that's I was, what happened. I, I was thinking about the campaign contributions ban that was floating around in the legislature the last two sessions. You know, if there's, if we know that, you know, government contractor money, people oh, right. tied to contractors. Yes, that's and making, it's built. Yeah. yeah, that's making us up yeah. a significant So all of this is coming from the top, right? And when I when we first began our discussion, it was all about um, ref reforming and restoring representational democracy in the House. Like, that's how we began the conversation. And I feel like, again, this is coming from the top down in a very controlling Environment, culture and environment. Uh, by the way, a controlling environment that breeds corruption because those who are at the center, closest to the center of power, they feel untouchable. They feel like they can get away with more things. Um, so that's, this is why we need it to be decentralized power, decentralized participation. Um, so yes, so I feel like once, um, we, once um, I'm elected, <laughs> but the mere fact that we've taken out the, the Speaker of the House who's been controlling on this issue, that it will free people to do what their constituents want them to do. You mentioned, um, you know, this thing we call it, colloquially like no conflict these rulings on conflicts of interest that happen during house votes uh you had suggested kicking those over to the ethics commission i'm just wondering procedurally you know how do you do that does the lawmaker need to wait then um on no. a ruling from the ethics commission no it's very quick i mean all they'll say is okay well what are your financial interests okay there's a conflict but right now literally it's you go you i mean we've have you guys seen the um is it john oliver um, well, it's this. I, we've seen the the video the skit with Joe Suki <laughs> right. years ago. It wasn't a skit. And, and sadly, it wasn't a skit. It was real. Um, but he basically said, "Oh, I'm a lobbyist for the plastics industry. I, I have, and and the issue was to ban plastics." He's like, "I have a conflict," and then the person goes, "Oh, no conflict." <laughs> I mean, it's like what? This is absurdity that makes people not trust government. And it's not okay. And the fact that no one, no one in the legislature will speak out against it, right? Because, oh, you know, that you don't want to speak out against leadership like that. <sighs> We're, I would be very comfortable saying, you know what, um, Emperor, you have no clothes on. And, and say to my peers, hey, you know what, he has no clothes on. Can we put a towel around him? Or can we clothe him or something? Like, wake him up to the fact that this is not okay. And the public is laughing at us and they're disrespecting us. Like, we are creating this environment. We're allowing, each 51 of us is allowing this to happen. What is our responsibility to every single voter to 
make sure that this doesn't continue happening. And I would be very comfortable with that. Uh, to go back to condos, some lawmakers have said that a special session on housing and condo issues wouldn't make sense without bills at the ready for the legislature to take up. Do you think there's enough ideas out there percolating that could warrant a special session? Yes, absolutely. In fact, one of the things that um, was said, I think maybe by my opponent, is that oh, we're going to sit back and monitor. I'm like, oh my God, some condos are experiencing 1,300% increases in their insurance. And you think you still need to sit back and monitor this when most of them are experiencing 600% increases? Uh, no, it's you need to act now. I mean, how many years? And that's just this year. Is it going to go up another 600% next year you know i mean how you need to stop thing you need to intervene now again they've been ignoring the the warnings from the condo advocates for now eight years you know so no stop dilly dallying get to work uh, and on one last audience question, do you think the legislative session should be year-round? You touched on it a little bit earlier, but could you elaborate? Um, I would be comfortable with that, again, as long as it kept people from having outside jobs. Um, and that, so it would actually work, uh, into, it would be a benefit in, in, in some ways. Um, other states have a, have a um, year-round legislature. Other states have one, one, um, one chamber. Do we need two chambers? You know, that's what, I mean, has the two-chamber system been working against us? So if we're going to reform to a year round, let's also reform to just have one assembly. Maybe that'll be more productive. Maybe that'll be more efficient. Uh, so that's another way of, I think, approaching that solution. Kim Koko Yomoto, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Why don't you give a round of applause to the candidate?